All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his blessed name for granting us this existence as I always mention and giving us the opportunity to exist eternally in a state of bliss and pleasure and gratitude and increased mercy. Allah has blessed us with two genders, male and female, and he could have made us all one gender <coughs> or many more genders, <coughs> but he chose two. Allah in the Quran says, <coughs> Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inna allahi atqakum O mankind, we have made you into male and female nations and tribes so you know each other, so that you recognize each other and that recognition lita'arafu the word is arafa meaning to know with elevation <clears throat> to know with an increased appreciation. As the Prophet says, Man arafa nafsahu. When we say somebody is an arif, meaning somebody who knows in an elevated state. Lita'arafu. So you know. So you appreciate. So you are grateful and you are submissive, therefore. And Allah ends it the most honorable indeed to Allah. The Almighty is one who is God conscious. And God consciousness here in the Quran at all times implies the promoter of good and the demoter of evil. When you are God conscious, it doesn't mean that you consider Allah to be great, you consider God to be great. No. You don't only consider God to be great, but you consider Him the ultimate authority in the universe and the one who created us for the promotion of good and the demotion of evil. So when we say atqaqum, people who are muttaqi, people who are God conscious, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means they are always doing good. They are never promoting evil. They are always promoting good, peace, justice, equity, love for humanity. For that is the principle of God consciousness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we've made you into nations and tribes. And if you examine our humanity, unfortunately, we have shot ourselves on our feet and taken one step forward, two steps backwards due to our bigotry, our misogyny, meaning that we don't only look against, in other words, we practice racism and bigotry against people of other nations and other cultures and other races. And we are also bigots when it comes to across the gender. One gender abuses the other. And historically, unfortunately, the male gender has been the cruel one that has meted out very, very evil uh, misbehaviors against the female gender, sadly. And it continues until today, unfortunately. Alhamdulillah, it's better than it was. Just like racism is better than it was. But unfortunately today, the forms of racism have become invisible. Where before, when it came to slavery, they were held in chains. And they were whipped in public. Today, the chains and the whipping is invisible. It's psychological. It's social. It's destructive, and we hold it within ourselves. And unfortunately, you see the remnants of it when this president was elected and people got together in Charlottesville and all of, that, all of those gatherings where the swastikas came out and the supremacists came out with their masks. You would think that this would have been buried with a while back, but it's alive among the people. And I believe all of this is alive because of our recklessness an abject misunderstanding, if not um, rejection of God and His mercy. When we deny the true message of God, we become bigots. We become arrogant. We become um, destructive in society. And these conversations, and when we talk about personalities that I'm going to speak about tonight, on the great tragedy, Shahada, meaning the martyrdom of the greatest, one of the greatest women who walked on this earth, 
Khadija bint Khawailid, as you know, her, her title, honorific title was at tahira the pure one, the wife of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's interesting that she was such an amazing figure that it is because of her we have the Islam that we have today in, in terms of her contributions. And I'd like to touch on that and to balance this equation that we should remove this insanity that lies within us, this hatred and this one-sided bigotry that we have many a times. We need to remove it. We cannot remove it if we don't understand the values of life. And sometimes it's essential that we remind each other. Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنْ نَفْعَةِ الذِّكْرَى Remind them. Reminding is beneficial. They seem to have forgotten a very fundamental piece of the equation when it comes to the balance of God's religion. The verse that I started is in Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah of the Quran, <coughs> the first verse. That all people, all mankind, be careful of your duty to your Lord. Ya yuhannasu taqu rabbakum alladhi. Be careful. When God says be careful, he means be just, be balanced, know your limits, don't overdo it. Be careful. Ittaqillah. Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum. Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. He made you from a single being. Adam and Hawa were made from the same material. Same composition. One is not superior to the other. This notion that women are like the byproduct of men. Or that, you know, whatever was left from Adam is was made for a woman. This is nonsense, nonsense. Men and women, male and female, Adam and Hawa were shaped together. It wasn't left over. This idea is, is a poison pill. You know, we take it so far and even claim that the reason Adam was expelled from paradise was because it was a woman who enticed him towards the tree. Once again, absolute nonsense. It's not true. This idea reeks with the satanic principles of causing disunity in the human race. When he says, By your authority, I will beguile them. I will fool them. I will cause them to kill each other. And what better than for them to fight against their genders, against their nations, and against their races, and against their uh, you know, families, and to divide us and destroy us. So we have to be vigilant, brothers and sisters. Tonight we have people of different faiths visiting us, as every night we're blessed to have them. The diversity is here to stay. God has made every human being diverse. There are no two human beings who are the same, even though they are identical in genetics. Our fingerprints are unique. Even identical twins have different fingerprints. Because Allah loves diversity. Some of us just cannot get out of our cocoon and our you know, one-sided tunnel vision, as we call myopia, where we think that the world is only for us and the universe revolves only for us. This self-centered, capricious idea that the world is only mine and we pontificate that, wow, I am the gift of God and therefore nobody else is, is nonsense. We are all gifts of God. Even an insect is a gift of God. A dog is a gift of God. A horse is a gift of God. An atom is a gift of God. It's silly. It's nonsense to make such comments. But when we are ignorant and tunnel visioned, then we try to say it's us versus them. We try to divide and shaitan is with us. The devil is with us and said, yes, you are my agent. Go, divide, divide, divide. And we find that the human race has been made of male and female purposely. And no two human beings are the same. You know, when you do research and say, how can you clone a person? Is it possible? It's impossible. Physically, we could clone a person to look identical. But it's impossible to clone a human being exactly because they would have to experience the same experiences to be who they are. And that's impossible. As I mentioned yesterday, the principles of probability 
and chance and what crosses us in our day-to-day -day transactions are impossible to recreate. Impossible. Each individual is unique, unique, unique. And I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, that's a divine decree. It's God's decree. We made you from one self. But how diverse you are. Allah says, I have shaped you even to your fingertips and made you unique. But what are we all trying to do? We're trying to maintain that if I'm unique, everybody should be like me. Follow me. My way or the highway. This is classic. We get into battles trying to convince the other side how wrong they are. Sure, it's okay to convince the other side if they are wrong. But there is a demeanor, there is an akhlaq, there is an approach. And we cannot be um, dictatorial in that manner. Allah says, There is no compulsion in religion. Truth is clear from error. Allah says, Hatu, qul, hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqin. Say to them, bring you evidence if you are truthful. There is a demeanor by which to bring equity. But difference of opinion should stay. Sadly, within our communities, when we have people of other faiths come and join us, sometimes we feel like, what are they doing here? Like as if this is exclusively ours. And I'm not saying you are. Sometimes in society, we have these close-minded, foolish people who consider their safe haven exclusively theirs between them and God. That worship is suspect. That's what the devil does. The devil said that. Shaitan said that. It's exclusively mine. I have a special position um, in the Malakut among the angels. I have a special position, though as you know, Iblis, the devil, is not an angel. He's not an angel. He's not a fallen angel. This is a wrong concept. Iblis was not, is not, has never been an angel. He is made of fire among the jinn. He's of a different creation from angels. Angels are creations made of light. Iblis is made of fire. He even says it. I am made of fire. Okay? Uh, and Allah says, وَكَانَ مِنَ jinn." He is of the jinn. He is of that creation. But his ideology is exclusivity and low tolerance for any other beings to exist in his domain that can be honored. Hence his fall. When God brought Adam forward, it says, Bow. For he's one more creation I've added into the plethora of my mercy. Bow. I said, no, I'm special. So if you and I claim to be believers in God, then let us remove this bigotry within ourselves, not only between the races and the cultures, but between our genders. And Allah has blessed us with the two genders. And I want to talk about how Islam works very much in concert, in uh, balance to try to bring the message of equity and balance for the whole human race. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When people of different faiths and colors join us, consider it a blessing. Where we should come to unity is the universal principle of good. I don't care if you're black, white, tall, short, wide, narrow, we all agree to promote good. Now that's unity. We all agree not to fight each other. We all agree to respect each other. We all agree to honor each other. That's the religion of God. Not come my way or else I kill you. You know, if you're a threat to me, I'm going to destroy you. Or my national security warrants that I come and kill all of you. Or I build my little, you know, um, I expand my land as you know who I'm talking about mm -hmm. why national security why you want to take the earth and throw us all in the sea for national security that bigotry is satanic it's evil and it causes hell on earth and too many lives are lost and too many refugees are being created as we speak because of this sin the sin that will be punished Allah will punish it severely on judgment day Allah says, don't worry. What they're doing today, you think they're strong? They've got those very fine fighter jets that they can bomb people? Don't worry. Let them do it. We allowed the Pharaoh
to dismember people. But we caught him and we gave him his due and he's going to get more of his due. Don't worry. لا يحزنك كفرهم. Don't worry. We will grab them. But what do you and I do in the meantime? We are proponents of justice. We are firm. And we bring equity for society. And we do not belittle any religion. We do not belittle any people who worship any kind of God that they believe to be. Even if they are atheists who say there is no God. We do not belittle them. We respect them. We have a dialogue with them. We bring equity. Imam Jaffa Sadiq wasalam, debated with Abdi, Ibn Abi Awja for a long period of time in Mecca. Imam never condemned him. Always allowed him to converse with him at all times. And the debate went on and on and on for a long time. The Imam never condemned him. Never said, oh, you're an atheist. You're going to hell. And I'm condemning you. You're najis, blah, blah, blah. None of this stuff. None. So as a principle tonight, in memory of this great lady, Khadija, alayhi salam, I want us all to believe in equity, please. For she was the scion of equity. As you know, she was the most beloved wife of the Holy Prophet. And the messenger loved her so much that he married no other woman when he was married to her. He was a pure monogamous. And you find that history is very clear that he said, Khadija and I will be in paradise together. By the way, there is no hadith where he states any of his other wives will be with him in paradise. There's no, ex no hadith. Some wives are good, some Allahu Alam. But my point is, the Prophet said, Khadija and I will be in paradise together. Let's leave it at that. Amazing. He loved her so much. Why did he love her so much? Even Bukhari mentions that Aisha, one of the wives of the Prophet, said, this messenger, even after her death, would never stop talking about her. That he would go and give gifts to the women who are the friends of Khadija. Even after her departure. And she would ask him why. He says, Khadija was with me when nobody believed in my message. Khadija spent all her wealth for the, prom for the promotion of good. She, she was my consolation. She was next to me. She was the first woman to accept my message. And historians say in the early days of the Kaaba, as Ibn Ab Abbas was sitting, as you know, the uncle of the Prophet, and a man was sitting next to him and he sees the Prophet, a young man come by the Kaaba and next to him was a young boy. You know, a young boy behind him and then behind that was a woman and, and they would do ruku and sujood at the Kaaba. It was unheard of at that time. No one understood what they were doing because people used to circumambulate in weird ways. Weird. I can't talk about it because it was very weird. And they were asking, who are they? He says, that's the man who's calling himself the prophet. He's the prophet of God. And that's his wife, Khadija. And that's Ali ibn Abi Talib. The three of them are praying to God. The first worshippers in that era were these three. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. The Prophet said, you know, Khadija salam, was an enterprising woman. Khuwailid, her father, was a wealthy man. But she became even wealthier with her trades between Syria and Yemen. And she used to send her goods and sell them on the market. And she never went on those trips. She always had a, an agent who represented that trade. And it came a time when she asked, uh, people came to her and said, there is a man who would be excellent um, to trade for you. And of course, as you know, the Holy Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala The last prophet for humanity was her distant cousin. They were from the same family. And he represents her in trade because he was known as as sadiqul Amin. He was truth, uh, trustworthy, honest. Sadiq al Amin. And he takes the trade for Khadija and he doubles her profits that year. But he was honest. He never cheated anyone. He always had an honest transaction. And, and there's research to show when you're honest, and you're kind, and you're pleasant, people love to trade with you. Research shows if you're kind with people, even if you, uh, for example, as a physician, okay, you have uh, 
a duty, a Hippocratic duty, to service your patients properly. Even if there's a mishap in your diagnosis, you'll find that when you're nice to your patients, they hesitate to sue. The lawsuits are minimal. Malcolm Gladwell writes that in his book, Blink. He said, research shows that if you're nice to people, even if you mistreat them accidentally, they do not get angry with you easily. And the Quran says, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَوْ عَدَى Kind speech and forgiveness is superior, is better than charity followed by injury. Meaning you give somebody something, then you taunt them. Hey, I helped you. Hey, you remember I did this for you. Taunting people. Quran says, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ Kind speech. You know, لا تسأر خدك للناس. Don't turn your face away from people. Soften your tongue, the Quran says. Be nice, be forgiving. The Prophet was the embodiment of the Quran. He is the walking, talking Quran. So he brought much business to her. But she was wealthy, intensely wealthy. They say she had an army of, uh, you know, workers who used to carry her wealth. That's how rich she was. And many men wanted to marry her. Many wanted to marry her. She was beautiful. She was sought after. She was intelligent. She was wise. I want us to imagine this reality as men and women in this society, in our community. How many of us try to be like her? Sisters, I advise you because Khadija salam was in your gender. How many of us, when we name our daughters Khadija, you know, how many of us tried to emulate her ways? Her demands were minimal, but she loved God. She sacrificed for Allah. She brought a beautiful child forward called Fatima, alayha salam. Fatima, Zahra, salamullahi alayha. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. As you know, she's Sayyidat al Nisail alameen. She is the leader of all the women, her daughter. As you know, we have four chosen women in Islam. Maryam, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him. Asiya, bint Muzahim, the wife of the Pharaoh. Khadija, wife of the Holy Prophet, and her daughter, the daughter of the Holy Prophet, Fatima al-Zahra, salamu alayhi. Four women chosen. And of course, there were many, but these were the elite, elite women in history. And Quran talks about some of them directly in Surah Tahrim. Maryam and Asiya are mentioned directly in the 66th chapter of the Quran. I'll touch on it briefly tonight, if time permits. But I want us to know the role of women, womanhood. I want us as a society to understand that neither gender is less than the other. This idea that women are less than men intellectually, spiritually, is all a fabrication. It's not true. Don't believe in it, please, please. You don't understand how dangerous that is. Let us not even harbor the idea that, you know, my sister or my mother or my spouse, my wife is not as spiritual as because I'm a man. This is total nonsense. Nonsense, please. In fact, when I was in the Islamic Republic, I asked Ayatollah Jawadi this question. I've mentioned this before. I'll share it again. Personally, I met him in Ramavan. And I asked him this question eye to eye. I said, are women inferior to men? And as you know, historically, uh, and even today, as a philosopher, he is one of the top regarded philosophers on women issues. So I asked him, are women less than men? He said, no. Are they intellectually less than men? He said, no. Are they spiritually less than men? He said, no. I said, then why are they not prophets or imams? Why did God not make them prophets? or the vicegerents, meaning successors to prophets. And he looked at me and said, they are mothers of our children. That in itself is like prophethood. It would be a double burden to have a woman become a prophet or an imam when she is the carrier of our next generations. But the equation is similar. That as motherhood, even Quran, has established, وَوَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا عَلَى وَحْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ أَنِشْكُلْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ We have enjoined goodness upon mankind, the mother who suffers pain upon pain for two years. Be thankful to me and to them for what they have done. 
So Allah establishes a very clear precedence that womanhood is very powerful. But he went further to say, but if you have any doubts, you will notice even the continuity of prophethood is dependent on women too. For you find Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam's continuity as the bridge from his predecessor prophet was his mother, Maryam alayhi salam. You find imamat, the entire continuity of the gate to the city of knowledge is a woman. The Jibreel, when he brings the eye of Tathir, he says, Hum Fatima tu wa abuha wa ba'luha wa banuha. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. It's Fatima, her father, her husband, her children. You see, uh, her. So the entire axial conversation is Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayhi, in the continuity. So let's not think this way. I want us to understand historically. And I always mention this on her night of Shahada, that in her era, when parents have a girl in the era of ignorance, they used to take the girl and bury her alive. And Quran says she will complain. That girl on Judgment Day will complain. Which sin did I commit that I was killed for? Because I'm a woman, I'm a female, I'm a girl. Today there are 70 million, I think 70 million more men just in India and China. 70 million more men. There's a reason for that. We are selectively choosing a gender. And sadly in China, women are getting kidnapped as married women and taken into villages and sold for money to become wives of other men. Because of the stupidity of mankind trying to imbalance the gender of blessings of God. That mankind, when families give birth, some, some families give birth to only boys. And some give birth to only girls. But measure the quantity of birth on earth. It's a miracle that it's 50-50 male to female. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But you find that uh, we are foolish because we think men when we have a male the name of the family will continue the money will stay in the family whereas if we invest in our daughters then they will be taken by their husbands and the in-laws will benefit this is not this is this is well I, I can't imagine humans actually go there I cannot imagine this is like not only re, it's not there's one thing to be silent about God's mercy it's like smacking at God's mercy. It's like slapping at God's mercy. No one rejects my bounties. And they used to bury. Can you imagine fathers used to go and hold their daughters and the daughter is excited that Baba is going to take me to play with the sand. That thought just puts a, a chill in my spine. That the human race is capable of doing that. And it was done. And it is being done today. Where families are selling their daughters to slavery and to prostitution. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. I always get touched by that. I said, my God, I, as much as I detest hell, I see why it exists. I detest it. But I can see why it exists. Let us today make that will that humanity is beautiful. When I asked Ayatollah Jawadi, I said, Ar-rijalu qawamun ala nisa The man has authority on the woman. What do you mean by that? If men and women are the same. He says that's a prescription of God in marriage. That the husband must provide for the wife. For she is already burdened with family affairs. And it is his responsibility from God to take care of his family and his wife and his children. That's why qawwa amuna. It doesn't make him better. I asked him in the family if the, wise, if the wife is wiser than the husband. Can she rule the house? He said, yes, of course. Whatever brings harmony towards the family is how it should be. And I asked him, how much is this authority? He said, the authority 
of her mother never changes over the children. She says, I'm an old, he said, I'm an old man. My mother, if she forbids me from going even to defend my nation, even for Allah, if she refuses me, then I cannot go. I'm an old man. I'm a married man. I have children. Why is my mother always my authority? If men have authority on women, then how is my mother having authority on me? In the era of the Prophet, he eradicated this burial. He eradicated this nonsense. In fact, historically at that time, if you were uh, a second wife and the husband dies, the children of the husband inherit their stepmothers and they can give them away like a trade. That's how it was. Women had no rights. Sadly, even in the United States up to the 1920s, women were not allowed to vote because they were considered second-class citizens. And the remnants of that continues today. We find that the Prophet abolished that, eradicated that, and gave the right of ownership and inheritance as was the right of, that God has conferred upon humanity. The Prophet established that. Khadija was in that era. And if you think it's the men who are financing the world today, I want us to remember that the expansion of Islam in the Prophet's time in Mecca and Medina was due to Khadija's wealth. She gave all her wealth, and historians say that when she was breathing her last, she had no money left. She had no money left. And I want us to understand that that level of womanhood is the Islam that Allah wants us to understand. Islam is a bird, free bird. It's got two wings. You cannot cut the right wing and put it on the left side. Don't try to make it look the same. It's uniquely different. But it's a wing like the other side. And each one flaps. You clip one side, the bird will go into a tailspin. That's what society is trying to do today. We are going into a tailspin because we are clipping each other's wings. Whereas we should honor the strength of each wing. And while it's uniquely a mirror image of the other, it's different and don't try to equate it in physical terms. In terms of status, in terms of worship, in terms of respect and degree, we are the same in the eyes of Allah. And Quran is replete with it. I don't have time tonight due to the short time I need to cover much of this topic. But you get my point. It's a free bird. It's dignified. And let's look at the opposite gender with dignity. And that brings me to the next question. Khadija salam, was a modest woman. She was not immodest. Modesty is under attack today, brothers and sisters. Hijab is under attack today. Modesty of the hijab of men is under attack today. When Allah says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say to the believing men to lower their eyes. And وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَلَا يُدْنِينَ زِينَةَهُنَّ Quran is giving the prescription of modesty. I want to touch on this briefly before I end with Khadija's contributions in the end and her sufferings. You find that Allah has established the modicum of modesty on us. You know what is the first command Adam got? when he approached the tree and his trial began? The first command was Allah said to Adam and Hawa, take the leaf from the tree and cover yourselves. That's the first command of Allah in the trial of humanity. Haya, covering our shame. Very important. And shaitan says, quwwat al Allah has given us many powers. One of them is the power of desire and lust. Quwwat al Shaitan says, I will abuse it. And I will abuse it so much, I will cause them also to destroy each other. Today, giants in Hollywood, Harvey Weinstein, a monster in Hollywood, was so reckless that any woman who dare appears in front of him that he liked was a victim. You find giants like Bill O'Reilly, Charlie Rose, many like them. And today, Morgan Freeman is under attack. You find all of these giants, 
millionaires slash billionaires. What is their objective? Use the woman like an object. Touch them whenever you want. Say any comments you want. Call them anything. Use them as creatures of pleasure. When Allah has enjoined modest dress upon us, it's not to keep us entertained or to keep him entertained or to put some burden on us. Allah says, Ya yuhan, Ya yuhan nabi, Qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna thalika adna an yu'rafna fala yu'dayna. O oh, Prophet, say, Qul li azwajika your wives, وَبَنَاتِكَ your daughters, وَنِسَاءِ mu'minin, and the believing women, that they cover themselves with an overgarment, lose clothes, lest they be troubled. And Allah says, this is better for them. ذَلِكَ أَدْنَى أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَا So they're elevated and recognized with dignity. You know, I see this hijab as the flag of Islam. I've always said this. When women wear this heart garb, some of them wonder, is it important? Is it not a burden on me? I want us to examine in the Western societies where we've shrugged our shoulders, where Hollywood today produces movies that are very, very ex explicit in exposés of the human skin, and we're very free in expression. Then why is it that these same free women who did date, who do date freely, why are they so repulsed that they're going to court and suing these men for sexual harassment? Why is it even accepted in court if we are so blasé about it? Because we all know that the nature of the humankind is that it's repulsive when somebody intrudes on the dignity of another person. They say Morgan Freeman would stand one inch from a woman and he'd look down like this because he's the big boss. Bill O'Reilly did the same thing. And these people were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Harvey Weinstein, he would meet them in the worst of ways, and women were terrified. Women are writing that when we would go and meet Harvey Weinstein, I mean Morgan Freeman, we would make sure we wear long clothes. We don't, we don't display our body parts too much. Really, so a predator is there waiting. Well, God says it's always around you. It's not only the Morgan Freemans. Every eye is looking at you. One sister came to me once, his brother, when I wear the hijab, you know, the, all the men are looking at me. I said, so if you don't wear it, they won't look at you? <laughs> That's a good one. I said, the difference is now they're looking at you with dignity. You're telling them, back off. Don't touch me and don't come near me. I am valuable as a human being. I'm dignified. Why is hijab instituted upon us? This is not in Islam, brothers and sisters. I once went to a synagogue and I had an, a, a, and a Jewish man is sitting next to me and we had a few sisters who came with hijab. He looks at me and says, what is it that your women are wearing? What is that? That, what is that? You know, in a condescending way, excuse me, what is that? I looked at him, I said, this poor guy is angry. I said, have you watched the movie Moses? He said, yes. I said, the mother of Moses was dressed like that. Did you ask the same question? He leans back and says, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> I said, the difference is we kept on with it. Some of us gave it up. But tell me, when is modesty going to change for humanity? Is time a stipulator of morality? Does modesty change in time? We used to laugh at people in the jungles who were scantily dressed and we called them heathens. And they would carve their faces and we called them heathens. And today we're doing the same thing they're doing. And we are civilized and sophisticated. So when we look at people of different faiths, this is a prescription from God not to burden us, to honor us. But why are women given that responsibility? Because they are the bearers of our children. And the woman is the source of humanity, is the growth of humanity, is the foundation of morality as the husband and the father is. But the mother, if she is tainted and given up into usage of different kinds, as people used to use women until today, sadly, then their children will have a very low foundation to stand on. But Allah is merciful. 
Allah in the same Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter which I quoted the verse from, Allah says when they are post-childbearing, they are not obligated to wear it. They don't have to wear it. But it is better for them to wear it. I see some of our sisters here who wear the full aba, and I look at them, they're all quite aged. But I ask, if I came to this woman and I asked her to remove that, she would look at me and say, shame on you. I said, but you don't have to. She said, but that's me. This is my nature. It's, it's become part of my fabric. You know how digni dignified that is? We don't understand this. We have to teach our societies that today in the Western world, giants are falling like flies because of this misbehavior. It's because our women sometimes sadly are going out there as objects and selling themselves as objects with all due respect. You find when you go to auto shows, you'll find women standing next to cars. Every once in a while I'll go, I said, why are the men not standing? We're ugly. I'm being sarcastic about it. Why are you standing next to the car? Does it come with the car? Why are you standing here? And they, they're stumped. Like, uh, I said, I know the marketing stunt, but with all due respect, you're dignified. Why are you standing here? A car is you? You are valued as a car? Excuse me. <laughs> I have much more respect for you than that car. Much more. Much more. This car is a piece of metal. You are standing next to it in scanty dress clothes trying to entice me to buy it? Let's move on, please. This dignity is within the prescription of God. And Khadija was dignified. Her granddaughter Zainab salam, goes to Karbala for that reason. And she stands on the altar of justice and says, how dare, you know who we are? We are the scions of morality and modesty. We represent the flag of God. That's why today it's being, it's being attacked. It's funny, people can put all kinds of bird cages on their heads, wear crazy clothes, it's old fashioned. You cover your hair, it's oppression. <laughs> it's oppression. So I'm going to move on with this, but I, 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 I hope you get my point. My time is up. I want to end tonight with Khadija as, as that woman of modesty. A woman who represented dignity, wisdom. Her daughter, Fatima al Zahra, when she goes to claim her right, Fadak, they say that Khutbah Lum'a was so sublime that philosophers until today are trying to dissect the wisdom of Fatima al Zahra. This is the daughter of the wisest woman. She struggles so much, Khadija struggles so much. That as you know, the Meccans decided to boycott. They decided to boycott the Banu Hashim in Mecca. And Abu Talib, uncle of the Prophet, had a valley called Shaybi Abu Talib, which was in the outskirts of Mecca. And they were forced to migrate there. And the Meccans refused to deal with them and feed them and give them any food. I want us to know historically that those pagans who were idol worshippers were the ones who were bringing food to the Prophet and his family in the night. Those who became very famous later on in history, they never came to Shaybi Abu Talib to feed the Prophet. I just want you to know that. It's interesting with all due respect. The pagans used to bring food for the Prophet. Khadija was there with them. She struggled, she suffered. They said they used to carry rocks on their bellies because the pain of the stomach due to hunger was so much they didn't know what to do but Khadija stood by her husband she never challenged she was a wealthy princess of the town she gave it all up Allah says Lan tanalul birra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. you will not achieve righteousness until you give with that which you love the most that was Khadija salam. that after the Shaybi Abu Talib when that treaty was eaten up by the ants at the Kaaba. The Meccans recanted, they rescinded the uh, boycott and the Prophet was allowed to come back and soon thereafter Khadija salam breathed her last. She became Shahida. She had no money. Completely spent it in the way of God. Historians say she was very satisfied. As you know, her daughter Fatima was there in Shaybi Abu Talib. She was five years of age. She used to nurse the Prophet. When people used to strike the Prophet, she used to nurse him. Fatima the Zahra salam, used to nurse, we, like Khadija did. That role of womanhood is the foundation of the Islam you and I have today, brothers. Our mothers are the foundations of humanity. And when Khadija passed away, when she became Shahida, the Prophet buried her. Historians say he cried and he cried and he cried. 
The prophet was so in love with her. Not material love, brothers and sisters. Spiritual love. That's why he said, Khadija and I will be in paradise together. Khadija salam in her name, let us make a promise to ourselves that we will be just, we will be generous, we will be patient. For to me, whenever I think of her, by the way, I went to her grave in, in Jannatul Mu'alla. Unfortunately, these creatures who are running the kingdom today, their occupation, demolished her grave uh, sarcophagus. And you can only look at her grave from the highway. They don't even let you go to her grave today. This great personality is not even allowed to be visited. That's how foolish and ignorant our leadership is today. But it doesn't matter. She is in our hearts. We will live and die in her ways. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman. ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته